would we consider to be a typical phenotype of a patient with COPD who's got small airways disease? And most patients with COPD have small airways disease, to be honest. We would expect them to have hyperinflation in terms of an increased total lung capacity. We'd expect them to have evidence of air trapping or gas trapping in terms of an increased residual volume. And when the residual volume goes up, by definition, the vital capacity goes down. We'd expect them to have an increased peripheral resistance and also to have an increased peripheral reactance, either as a, a reduced uh, value of um, reactance at 5 hertz or an increase in the area under the curve. And if you bothered to do multiple breath nitrogen washout, you'd find that they would have evidence of ventilation heterogeneity in terms of SASIN or SCOM. And if you did a high resolution CT scan, you would expect to see an increase in low attenuation areas as well. So let's have a look at a, a wee case study here. So this is a patient with um, severe COPD <coughs> where we gave them again inhaled salbutamol. This was a 74 year old man, a heavy smoker, was getting breathless, had reduced air entry in his upper zone, so he probably had some emphysema despite having a normal chest x-ray, had a slightly low oxygen saturation, normal exhaled breath nitric oxide, which you'd expect, and had low eosinophils. Um, when we gave him salbutamol, and we'd see this quite often, what we found was that when you do repeated forced expiratory maneuvers, is that it can actually induce bronchoconstriction. And that's exactly what happened here. If you compare the baseline compared to post salbutamol, you can see the F of E1 fell. So as he did repeated forced expiratory maneuvers, he got expiratory dependent bronchoconstriction. You can see his F of E1 fell and his force vital capacity fell. But at the same time, you can see that he had a fall in resistance, mostly in R5, rather than R20. You can see that his compliance also changed significantly. And you can see particularly what changed was the area under the reactance curve. So let's put some numbers on that. The total area resistance changed by 35%. The peripheral reactance at 5 hertz changed by 53%, and the biggest change of all was seen in the area under reactance curve. And that's really the key measure in COPD. If you're going to take one measure away in COPD, it's going to be the AX, the area under the reactance curve. That's where you're going to see the greatest signal. So let's tie up um, COPD. As you've seen, that resistance and compliance are relatively discordant in COPD, whereas they are more concordant in asthma. In other words, you get a much greater change in X than you do in R. The large airways uh, measured at 20 hertz for resistance, you've seen that they're, they're really not involved much in COPD. And you certainly don't see a bronchodilator response in response to beta agonist or long acting muscarinic antagonist in terms of large airways. So what I would say is that lung compliance, measured as reactants, as the AX, is much more sensitive than measuring resistance to either bronchodilatation or bronchoconstriction. So let's just look at a head-to-head. -head. This is a review that I wrote, you might want to read in respiratory medicine, on the utility of uh, measuring um, spirometry and airway oscillometry. So I think this table is useful. So the outputs, you already know what you get in airway oscillometry and spirometry. They both have an excellent signal to noise ratio. I think spirometry is not patient friendly because it's quite hard to do a forced expiratory maneuver, particularly in COPD, breathing out all the way to residual volume. Um, the breathing pattern is measured at tidal normal quiet breathing, and it's a forced expiratory maneuver. Now, how many patients do you see normally in everyday life doing a forced expiratory maneuver? Whereas everyone breathes normally at tidal, tidal volume. You can um, distinguish between large and small airways very easily with airway oscillometry, but it's much more difficult to do with spirometry, even measuring FEF 2575. The one advantage that spirometry does have is it's relatively inexpensive 
in terms of the machine compared to airway oscillometry. Um, they're both portable, at least with the tremor flows portable, and they're both um, uh, regulatory approved by the FDA.